My name is Lisa Chadwick. I am a program director in the Division of Extramural Research and Training at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. That's the one in North Carolina. Um, and I'm really happy to be here today and not watching on webcast so that I can welcome uh, Dr. John Stamatoyanopoulos to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. Um, John is a professor in the Department of Genome Sciences and Medicine at the University of Washington. And more recently, he became the director of the new Altius Institute for Biomedical Research, which is also in Seattle. Um, John's career has really been focused on using high throughput methods to understand how the genome functions. Um, he primarily uses an assay that um, uses DNA one digestion to identify regions of the genome that have open chromatin signatures. And that has proven very useful for marking the important parts of the genome, the regulatory elements. And he's used that uh, to great effect as part of several large consortia sort of focused on this problem, like ENCODE and the Roadmap Epigenomics Program. Uh, so I hope you'll help me welcome John to the stage. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lisa. All right. Um, well, it's really a delight to be here. I was actually telling some of the students uh, Oh, uh, fellows and uh, students over lunch that I was, uh, in, in the not too distant past, a, a po post back here at the NIH, um, in fact, in this building, exactly. Um, and uh, uh, so I have a lot of fond memories here. I'm really delighted to be, to be back. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the, the general topic of decoding the human genome. Um, and I have uh, put the um, uh, tagline, getting to 2020, thinking not only about getting clarity on the problem of solving genome function, but also try to look ahead to the next four or five years uh, and, and what that might bring. So throughout my talk, I'm going to refer to some, some simple things here, which I've cartooned uh, in, in the following way. Much of the focus of the talk is going to be on uh, regulatory DNA. So as many of you may recognize, this is a cell, this is uh, a DNA wound around uh, nucleosomes packaged up in, into the nucleus of cells. Um, we've got genes, genes make RNA, and then there are these regions of the genome which I'm generically going to refer to as regulatory DNA, which encode instructions which are actuated by the binding of, uh, of sequence-specific DNA binding proteins, commonly referred to as uh, transcription factors which trigger a wide variety of downstream events, uh, recruiting enzymes that put on uh, histone tail modifications, modify DNA methylation, interact with the repair machinery, et cetera. So I'm going to divide my talk into three broad areas. First, I'm going to talk about uh, things that we have learned, that is, key principles that have emerged during the last uh, five to seven years, particularly from genome scale analysis of regulatory DNA uh, in the context of major projects uh, like the ones that, that Lisa uh, referred to. The second thing I'm going to talk about is to address uh, and define what I think are four key challenges that face us now in 2016 looking forward uh, in uh, understanding the delineation, the connection, uh, the causal actuation and the categorization of, of regulatory DNA. And then I will wrap up by looking forward, um, trying to define that road to clarity and, and also looking at what the next few years might bring in the face of what are continuing to be exponential changes in technology. Just briefly, though, I want to start out with a, a timeline um, on mapping the human regulatory genome. And, and this is a timeline that actually extends quite a ways back, um, back all the way to, to the 1970s. And, and really, uh, I think a seminal observation that uh, was made during this time, the mid-70s, by Mark Rudine and Harold Weintraub was the observation that there's an intimate connection between the physical structure of the genome and its organization in chromatin. And the activation of genes in a cell-type-specific fashion. 
So this uh, uh, observation was really made in, in the face of uh, looking back on the paper's pretty primitive technologies, pre-PCR, pre-southern blots, pre a lot of the uh, a lot of the techniques that we use today. But but that time was followed very shortly by a burst of activity in the late 1970s when very fundamental technologies emerged for DNA detection, uh, RNA detection, and also uh, a technique for looking at protein DNA interactions, uh, DNA footprinting. And these were, uh, uh, at least some of them were shortly bundled up um, into the, the recognition that native regulatory elements in genomes are marked by altered chromatin states. And this was a, a uh, discovery that was made roughly contemporaneously by, uh, by Sally Elgin and, and Carl Wu uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, also Gary Felsenfeld and Hal Weintraub, all within a span of about 18 months or two years, had, had seminal papers uh, uh, in this area. And that discovery that elements were marked by altered chromatin structure provided now a vehicle with which investigators could employ to define those elements systematically in genomes. And it was recognized uh, fairly quickly, starting with uh, in vitro assays, but also moving in vivo, um, that uh, all gene regulation was not at promoters, that there were distal elements that were controlling genes. And I can define, uh, somewhat arbitrarily, a period of uh, around 20 years where there was systematic, deliberate mapping of regulatory DNA that was undertaken uh, with a very simple approach, which is to define alterations in permanent structure, to identify the elements underlying those alterations, and to connect those elements with specific genes uh, and, and describe how they drove their expression uh, or, or other features. And, and if one goes back through that era, we, uh, uh, a little while ago, went and collated a fairly vast literature. And coming to the time when the human genome was sequenced, you can define around 300 human regulatory elements that have sufficient information in them, sequence information, that allow them to be resolved to the current build of the human genome. So that's where things th stood uh, at the time that the human genome was sequenced. Now, following the sequencing of the human genome, there was a burst of activity in technology development. Uh, it was partly spurred by the genome and partly spurred by the natural evolution of a number of other uh, techniques. And this resulted in the development of assays that could be uh, applied initially to large stretches of the genome, 1 percent of the genome, 10 percent of the genome, and eventually the entire genome, uh, looking at alterations in chromatin structure uh, and DNA accessibility with DNA-seq. Uh, looking at modifications of histones and also localization of DNA binding proteins with ChIP-seq uh, and, of course, transcript mapping with, with RNA-seq. And then, subsequently, in the context of projects in, uh, including ENCODE and ROADMAP uh, as, as uh, main drivers, these techniques were scaled to perform regulatory DNA mapping in very large numbers of cell and tissue types. And uh, really, this concept that regulatory DNA could be mapped, uh, that it initially could be mapped in small loci, scaled up to the entire genome, and then scaled across cell types, has now enabled a situation where the systematic sampling of cells and tissues in both definitive and uh, developing context has yielded uh, really an enormous amount of information that is now recoverable in public databases. Um, there are in, there's information now uh, in, again, a completely accessible form from over 500 cell and tissue types and developmental states. Um, and it's uh, in such a form that you can put your magnifying glass on any spot in the genome, pull up any number of different cell types uh, you want, uh, going into the hundreds, and, and you can watch uh, the regulatory DNA turning on and off. And in most cases, what we find is that cells, individual human cells, actuate about 150,000 elements uh, that are detectable as DNA's hypersensitive sites. And that equ that's equivalent to about 1 percent of the genome. 
in any given uh, cell or tissue that is moving into that state. But as, as you can see here, uh, even going from one cell type to another and watching uh, with these peaks here, signifying the activation of regulatory DNA, uh, in, you know, even in one type of blood cell and another type of another blood cell, there's tremendous cell selectivity, which I'll, which I'll get back to. So just kind of taking stock of the picture where things stand currently, and back to this, uh, this cartoon, if we, if we look in the gene compartment, uh, the genome is, is starting to settle out into a set of around 60,000 genes. And I put genes in quotes here because here I'm encompassing um, both around 21,000 traditional protein coding genes, roughly 40,000 uh, non-coding RNA genes that have a canonical gene organization. They've got a promoter, they've got exons, they splice, they, they look just like genes, they have regulatory elements, uh, but they're just not making protein products, uh, or at least obvious ones. Um, and then, of course, there are very large numbers of smaller RNAs that are outputted in a focal fashion in the genome, and, and this number is, uh, uh, exceeds a million at, at the moment, but these are of, of undefined function. So this compartment here is controlled by this compartment here and also greatly dwarfed by it because at the moment uh, we have defined in excess of 3 million regulatory regions. And again, uh, only a small subset of these, around 150,000, are, are actuated within any given cell type. And within those regions, uh, extrapolating from our, 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 our best data, it appears there are at least uh, 15 million transcription factor recognition elements that, that are encoded in the genome. So what have we learned from looking at all of this data? What I'm going to do is to tick through several uh, vignettes, one uh, in development and differentiation, just stating some high-level principles uh, and in many cases unexpected findings that we have learned from having such uh, a bounty of data and being able to analyze it in a coherent way. I'll talk about uh, some big picture conclusions relating to the relationship between this information and our understanding of common disease, uh, of evolution of the regulatory genome, and also the relationship between the regulatory genome and cancer. So with respect to development and differentiation, these are obviously uh, topics of enormous interest. And really, I think one of the key findings and cardinal features of maps of regulatory DNA that became apparent even after the first 10 data sets were, were produced uh, in probably the 2007, 8, 9 timeframe is that most of the regulatory DNA exhibits marked lineage and cell type selectivity. So that most of the genome does not look like this. This is a promoter where things are on in every cell type, but rather exhibits either extreme selecti cell selectivity or highly patterned and organized cell selectivity. And it became apparent after getting more and more data that these patterns are not random, but in fact represent an unexpected organization in the actuation of regulatory DNA such that by examining the patterns that are, that are evident in definitive cells, one can actually derive uh, lineage relationships, essentially memories that are encoded in regulatory DNA patterns of prior developmental fate decisions. So if you went and pulled out 50 different cell types uh, of definitive cells, all kinds of different primary cells, and just clustered their regulatory DNA patterns, you would see uh, partitions into major compartments, mesoderm, uh, derivatives of, hem of, uh, of the hemangioblasts, endothelial cells, blood cells, all hierarchically organized and all reflective of developmental fate decisions that occurred far before uh, these cells took their definitive form. And further examination has revealed that what is really going on as cells differentiate is that they are starting with a primitive compartment, and that that compartment is contracting and new material is coming up as the cells differentiate. And within a given progenitor state, the cycle starts again. 
uh, this, this, this persistent set from primitive cells is now contracting further, the new material here is contracting further, and new material is coming up. And doing the math on this in the lineages where we've been able to follow this phenomenon, it appears that, uh, in sort of extrapolating, it appears that around half of the regions that we detect in fully differentiated cells reflect some type of elements which are persistent from prior cell states. And so therefore, looking at the regulatory genome immediately then partitions itself into two compartments, a compartment that is likely active in maintaining the, in defining and maintaining the gene expression program of a defined cell, and that's a compartment that generally came up late in terminal differentiation, and a compartment that reflects uh, memories of prior events. And so, just to cartoon some of these features out, as cells are differentiating, the size of their landscape is also contracting as cells are moving from primitive cells down to definitive cells, contracting from around a quarter million elements in the most primitive cells down to 100,000 or even less elements in, uh, in the most well-differentiated cells. They're systematically passing on information as persistent elements. And also, the landscape is reflecting Essentially, if one just looks at the elements that are turning on and off, it reflects a hierarchy of activation of transcription factors. And then actually by looking at that patterning of on and off elements, one can actually derive backwards uh, that, hier that hierarchy with, uh, with, with surprising results. As part of the roadmap project, there was a, uh, an expansive effort to map regulatory DNA in developing human tissues, and uh, this was co conducted in a, variety, a variety of different uh, definitive cell or tissue types that were sampled uh, across an entire trimester of, uh, of development and had regulatory DNA mapping, uh, uh, DNAs1 assays, and also a histone modification and transcription done. This revealed that there's a quite large compartment of uh, regulatory DNA that is present in primitive cells that's not present in definitive cells, no matter how broadly we have sampled uh, definitive cells. And, and this compartment also uh, has a number of important properties because it turns out that it lends, uh, it provides actually a new lens on the interpretation of regulatory variation that may be associated with disease and also what's going on in, in cancer cells, which, which I'll get to. This developmental regulatory DNA also allows one to visualize highly organ restricted, so, so cell types uh, are not only restricted, sorry, regulatory DNA is not only restricted in cell types, tissues, but it's also restricted on an organ level, which in some cases are aggregation of, uh, of tissues. And this information, uh, as I mentioned, is something that can be mined to derive even uh, where one, even in the absence of prior knowledge, one can look at the organ selective sites and essentially define uh, all of the major known developmental regulators involved uh, in, in human uh, morphogenesis. In the area of common disease, one of the uh, seminal insights that has uh, come forward and spawned a variety of different research avenues is the observation that disease and trait-associated variants are concentrated in regulatory DNA. And this really was uh, the fortuitous confluence of two different uh, and, and in the beginning completely independent lines of investigation. One was seeking to use genetic association studies to define variation associated with common diseases and traits, which required no mapping, simple, uh, uh, straightforward focus on genotyping and sequence. And another stream which was mapping the regulatory DNA. And these came together in, in 2012 with this observation that most of the variants that were uh, landing, that were associated with common diseases and traits, uh, particularly in uh, well-replicated studies, uh, the significant majority were landing in regulatory DNA. And moreover, were landing in regulatory DNA that was highly selective 
for particular cell types and states. So say variants associated with particular uh, uh, cardiac traits, localizing elements that were selectively on uh, in, in the heart. And as more data have become available and better genetic association studies have been conducted with more power, greater number of individuals, higher quality studies, these observations have not only become, uh, have not only been replicated, but they have been really enhanced in the sense that the magnitude of the effects that we see now are, are far greater than what was initially observed. Um, and what we have found is not only that there are variants that are, so this is sort of the normal threshold here for t uh, calling something genome-wide significant, and what this plot is reflecting is the concentration of variants associated with red blood cell traits in, in the regulatory DNA of different red blood cell uh, types, the, the purple being other hematopoietic cell types and the gray down here being other, uh, a wide variety of other cell and tissue types. So it's the case that not only the most strongly associated variants with given traits are localizing in regulatory DNA, but actually in this compartment here, there are hundreds of so-called sub-threshold variants that are likely making small incremental contributions to uh, a trait, which one now can pull out with regulatory DNA. Another thing which was observed is that there is a temporal aspect to the localization of variants in, in regulatory DNA in the sense that variants that were associated with traits that are uh, early, related to early developmental exposures, uh, agent menarche, uh, classical Barker traits, tended to localize in regulatory elements which were selectively on in the fetal stage versus the adult stage, whereas one finds traits that are associated with uh, expo you know, adult exposures or uh, inflammatory diseases, diseases of aging, bone mineral density, cancer, Alzheimer's, tend to localize in variants that are found exclusively in uh, adult cells and tissues. Another aspect that is very challenging, and challenging not only to execute but also to emphasize, is the fact that context is absolutely vital to understanding and interpreting genetic variation, particularly in the regulatory compartment. All genetic variants are in non-coding regions uh, are interpreted in an epigenetic fashion, and meaning that there are some, some overlying events that have to occur in order to express that, that variant. And if we look at, for example, any region that has trait-associated variation, so here's an example of uh, a gene, BCL11A, that has variation associated with a trait, fetal hemoglobin expression, uh, that is lying in an enhancer region. And this is what that region looks like as one goes from uh, hematopoietic progenitor cells down to uh, more definitive erythroid cells. And one can see the region sort of sprouting up. But this, of course, means that the variation that's associated with this trait is essentially functionally silent in these earlier populations. Now what that means in the big picture is that every variant has a time and a place of effect. And really understanding that and defining that clearly is one of the major challenges going forward. And just to see this in, in action, we can take this same series and we can look at uh, a variety of different variations. So these are, this is 20 different regulatory regions from around the genome. These are a variety of, of uh, trait-associated variants in, uh, in these regions. These are what the regions look like in a model cell type in K562 cells. This is what the regions look like in hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. And then following them down through differentiation, one finds variants and elements that stay on, variants and elements that are are on and then turn off, elements that, that upregulate themselves, et cetera. So context really is uh, the ultimate key to interpreting uh, regulatory variation. In the area of evolution, a lot of insight has recently come forward from analysis of the regulatory DNA compartments of the mouse genome. And this is done uh, in, in the context of the Mouse ENCODE project. And I'm just, I'll share just some results from analysis and com direct comparison of the DNAs1 uh, map data from mouse and human. So in, in parallel with the human, there was a wide sampling of uh, mouse cells and tissue types. And 
one of the things that emerged was that only around a third of the elements that were identified in mouse as active elements could be found in the human genome as, as active elements. And so that there was essentially a very large amount of turnover in the regulatory landscape. And this is true for elements that were defined by DNAs1, for elements that are defined uh, by, by, uh, by any other measure. So tremendous evolutionary turnover. But one of the striking things, which I think really speaks to the sophistication with which a regulatory genome evolves, is that if you look broadly around the genome and just ask, what we have all of this turnover of the regulatory DNA compartment, and yet we still make similar organs, we still, you know, have similar functions with, with the mouse. What is actually being conserved? And one of the most remarkable findings is that if one looks in regulatory DNA elements in the same specialized cell type, in this case regulatory T cells, between human and mouse, you find that uh, around 26 percent of the actual regions are shared. So, you know, roughly two, th three quarters of them are not shared between human and mouse. But if you go into those regions and then you ask, and I, what are the recognition sequences for different transcription factors? And I, and I ask, of the mouse landscape, what proportion of it globally, genome-wide, is occupied by this factor, this factor, this factor? And you tally that number up for the mouse genome, then you effectively scrambled everything and tallied that number up for the human genome. The stunning result is that those numbers are, are almost constant. And so what this means is that in some way, evolution has been acting not only to preserve, or not chiefly to preserve individual regulatory regions, but rather to preserve a global regulatory state that is defined by the large-scale uh, distribution of recognition sequences. Another key observation was that if one looks at the recognition landscape of transcription factors on the genome in the mouse and in the human and mines that space, the space that's defined by protein DNA contacts that are mappable with DNAs1 footprinting, and mines that space for recognition sequences, one finds that the effective repertoire of the human and mouse factors in spite of the evolution that has happened at the protein coding level, which is actually relatively modest between the two, but the effective repertoire is nearly identical. There's very little that is specific to human and mouse. And so when we think about conservation between mouse and human, we can think on many different levels. We can think about the conservation of individual DNA bases, but then we can also think about higher level properties, like the one I just mentioned, and also about the structure and organization of regulatory networks. And one of the remarkable things that came out of this analysis was is that if one looks at the level of individual transcription factor footprints on, a geno on the genome that can be resolved to an identical position, the human and mouse share around 22 percent of those. If you map regulatory networks encompassing transcription factors, i.e., Transcription factor A regulates transcription factor B, regulates transcription factor C, and you can construct a mutual interaction network for all of the several hundred transcription factors uh, that have defined recognition sequences. If you look at the connection between any two transcription factors, the conservation of that connection, whether it occurred on, it, no matter how it occurred, in other words, through a particular DNA element in one position, or the DNA element is moved to another position, those connections are conserved about 44 percent of the time. And then if you go to a higher level and ask what is the organization of the transcription factor regulatory network in terms of its utilization of network motifs and other structural features, you find that the human and mouse networks uh, are practically indistinguishable. So it's a case where evolution is operating in this domain and really taking advantage opportunistically of what arises in, uh, in the more DNA-focused domain. Some of the key insights that we've gotten from cancer, uh, and this is an area of, of active research, I mentioned earlier that 
the existence of a large compartment of fetal regulatory DNA that's not detectable in adult cells had provided some insights into cancer genomes. And the key finding there can be distilled in a very simple fashion, which is that what cancer cells appear to be doing is that somehow it, during the process of oncogenesis, they reactivate primitive developmental programs that result in the reactivation of fetal regulatory DNA. When we look at cancers, initially before we had the fetal data, we looked at, at, at cancer regulomes and our general impression was a lot of new stuff here, we don't see any of this in normal cells. But it was only when we got the fetal data that we realized that all of the so-called new stuff was actually old stuff that was being flipped on, but in a haphazard way. It wasn't unwinding development, it was actually re-scrambling it. So, cancers that would arise in a skin lineage were reactivating fetal elements from brain and from other, you know, from liver, et cetera. One of the additional striking observations that's come from integrating regulatory DNA and cancer data is that there is a very tight relationship between the distribution of mutations in cancer genomes and the distribution of regulatory DNA and both at a very high resolution at the level of individual elements and also uh, uh, globally. And the, the relationship is striking uh, if viewed on an individual level where DNA's hypersensitive sites are in cancer genomes are, are uh, the coldest spots in the genome. They have less mutations than exons than anything else. And this is, uh, appears to be due to heightened action of DNA repair in those areas. But it turns out that it's not just the hypersensitive sites that have this phenomenon. When you do an assay like DNAs1, you're getting essentially a continuous signal of DNA accessibility across the genome. And if you plot that continuous signal, so which I'll do here, in relation to the distribution of mutations. So here what I'm looking at are, I'm going to plot uh, the density of mutations, C to T mutations in melanoma on the vertical axis. On a secondary axis, I'm going to plot uh, DNA accessibility measured by DNAs1, where, where higher values actually indicate less accessibility. So the most accessible stuff is down here, and the most compact stuff is up here. And if you plot this uh, across the genome, these two variables, this is the pattern that you get. Actually, this is across a chromosome. So you see there's a very, at this, at this resolution, and I can go finer and finer and finer all the way down and see this pattern at practically any scale that I look. But one of the most uh, remarkable observations is that what I have plotted here is actually the correlation between melanoma mutations and, in blue, the chromatin accessibility pattern of melanocytes. So, in other words, the cell of origin. And it turns out that if you redo this exercise, and I plot it versus the regulatory DNA or the DNAs1 profile in, uh, in melanoma cells, I get a much worse correlation. So the cell type of origin, its chromatin landscape before it became cancer, matches much more closely with the, uh, with the distribution of, of mutations. And so this leads to the tantalizing hypothesis that very early in carcinogenesis, cells undergo some type of an event that essentially distributes somatic mutation that's subsequently inflated or distorted uh, at, by the trajectory of the tumor. And it's interesting that uh, some newer analyses, uh, phylogenetic analyses of, of cancers are starting to point to this conclusion as well. But on a practical level, it also means that if I know the pattern of mutations in a cancer, which I can get just by sequencing, by comparing that without knowing anything else, by comparing that to regulatory DNA patterns of normal cells from reference indices like in code and roadmap, I can figure out what is the cell of origin of that cancer. And, and it turns out that this works remarkably well, so that you can go across different cancer types. This is uh, in melanoma uh, and hepatocellular carcinoma, colorectal, et cetera, and overall find that you can predict with almost 90% accuracy the cell type of origin of a cancer simply by looking at the mutation profile you get from sequencing and comparing it to a reference 
large-scale index of regulatory DNA. So I've just given you some vignettes in several different major areas. Uh, I could have spent the entire talk giving additional vignettes in these areas and, and, and going into many others. But suffice to say that what has happened in the last five to seven years is this transition from getting a few maps on the human genome to be able to get lots and lots of maps on lots of different cell types has really started to bear unexpected fruit in a wide variety of areas and is serving essentially as the catalyst for the integration of a broad range of data which previously was completely disjoint. Cancer sequencing data, uh, genetic variation data, et cetera, all coming together in uh, this aspect of the genome. So next I want to highlight four key challenges that we're facing now in uh, going forward in uh, the following areas, in the delineation of regulatory DNA, its connection uh, uh, with uh, the connection between elements, what triggers it, and um, how is it categorized. So to kind of define these more clearly with delineation, we're interested in sort of answering the question, where is all the regulatory DNA? And here I'll assert that the technology and processes to answer this question to substantial completeness within five years, I think, are already in hand. It's really a matter of the application, the concerted application of those approaches. The connection problem, which elements are talking to which genes or to, or to one another. Um, there are some computational approaches currently that allow us to make some predictions for maybe 20% uh, of, of the space. And uh, really, the, I think the technologies and analytical frameworks for validating those predictions and completing the map are really now just starting to come into focus. In the area of causation, we can ask what are the agents that actualize the potential of regulatory DNA? What are the factors that recognize those sequences? We've been walking around thinking, well, we've got a defined set of transcription factors. But as I'll uh, show you in a minute, I think the dramatis personae for this uh, is really very far from being complete. And the, the final question, categorization, which is easily, I think, the most challenging of these, um, is this question of what do all these millions of elements do? And this is an enormously complex problem that lacks currently a clear path forward. We're essentially staring at a big forest and trying from the outside to ask, how many different kinds of animals live in the forest? And what do they look like and how do I recognize them? And without really having any uh, uh, clear path forward. In the question of delineation, I'd shown this earlier. Um, much of the work to date has been uh, focused on what we might call bulk cell or tissue uh, samples. And in the case of the assay that we have been using, the DNAs1 assay, we basically get cells, uh, we treat them with DNAs1, it releases these little fragments, we collect the fragments, we sequence them, uh, we you know, can do this for different cell types, you map them back to the genome, you see the regulatory DNA sprouting up, um, you can do this in, in uh, you know, so here are the DNA's hypersensitive sites, there's all the regulatory DNA, underneath all of this are some transcription factors bound to the genome. If we sequence these really deeply, we can find uh, the footprints of transcription factors as they're bound to the genome, blocking the action of the nuclease. And this compartment, of course, you know, defines promoters, enhancers, uh, et cetera leading to about 150,000 elements, as I mentioned. Well, what has happened in the last uh, roughly eight or nine years is that there has been a fairly dramatic reduction in the cell requirements for attaining this information. So what I've graphed here are the requirements in, the pro in our production level pipeline uh, for producing the ENCODE data that's released into the public repositories. Back when, when uh, the last phase of, of ENCODE had started, it was around 10 million cells. It dropped to about a million cells by the end of that phase. Um, but for the last you know, year and a half, we've been operating, uh, or around a year, been operating less than 100,000 cells. And right now, a production pipeline uh, is operating routinely with around 50,000 cells. Now, 50,000 cells turns out to be kind of a magic number. Because if you look in the human body, and you ask, what are all of the anatomically defined, well-defined structures 
that have a physiological function that has been related to normal physiology or disease, it turns out that you get to about 400 and something uh, different structures, virtually all of which have in the range of 30 to 50,000 cells or, or more. And, and you may think that, gee, how is that, how is that sort of possible? And I think part of the problem is that we're so used to looking at cells in culture dishes and seeing these huge puffy things rolling around. But by the time you get into tissues, tissues are tremendously compact. I can take a millimeter by millimeter by 20 micron piece of kidney, and that's got over 100,000 cells in it. So just to give you an idea of the size uh, when you actually get into the body. So that means at this level, uh, at this level, we're actually positioned to complete a human body map that can be aligned completely with uh, physiological and nosological function. And what kind of made this possible was re-engineering the assay uh, that we have been using all these years into kind of a single chamber, very rapid assay where you can just treat the cells uh, and then uh, use a variety of manipulations that don't require anything leaving the tube to finally getting your uh, product. And, and you can do this in such a fashion that you can maintain high quality. Because one thing, all of the other vignettes that I showed you previously all have one thing in common, and that's that their fundamental conclusions came forward from having very high quality data. And if the data were of lesser quality, that they wouldn't have made it. So the key is going low with very high quality. And, and in this case, I can just show you examples of data that are produced at 500,000 cells, 2,000 cells, down to 100 cells. And this is showing the quality scores, which are showing the overall signal uh, uh, as a proportion of tags that are coming through. And this can even be pushed down to the level of uh, DNAs1 footprints. Now, having an assay that performs like this allows one to dive even deeper into the body and to achieve something which has here, heretofore not been readily possible with genomics, which is to unify the information that a pathologist sees under a microscope or anybody sees in terms of tissue architecture. So there's an enormous amount of information in the way tissues are laid out and organized that now is potentially accessible through techniques like laser capture, uh, microdissection, or through systematic gridding to define elements that, and map them directly to particular structures. Now, having a single chamber assay allows, through the use of robotics, massive scale up. So suddenly, every single well of a plate becomes an assay. Machines can run many plates a day. And, and suddenly, one is in a, a world of tens of thousands, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of assays genome-wide per year. And what that, having that level of scale finally puts in reach a compartment which has been heretofore very difficult to address systematically, which is the compartment of conditional or state-dependent elements, elements that only show their face when a particular exposure is given to cells or when the cells are, are perturbed in different ways, treated with a drug, et cetera. This is a pretty enormous landscape we know from anecdotal experiments, but now one can address it systematically. In a single tube of blood, one can sort out essentially every cell uh, that is listed here and uh, conduct perturbation experiments on them uh, with immune stimulation, immunosuppressants, et cetera. These experiments rapidly escalate in size. So to do an experiment uh, like this, taking all these cells and, and, and perturbing it here, one is right away with some replicates and a few donors, you're into thousands of data sets. But that's actually something that is becoming tractable. A final aspect of delineation is defining not only where the regions are, but where within them the function is encoded at a nucleotide level. Genomic footprinting allows you to define spots where regulatory factors are bound, but it doesn't tell you which of those factors is the most important in mediating function. Or within one of those recognition sequences, which are the most important nucleotides from a functional perspective, not just the ones that show up with uh, the best motif logo. And it turns out now another stream that can be unified, independent stream that can be unified with regulatory DNA and the entire Regulome project 
is that of genome editing and engineering. And when you use an editing reagent, whether it's Cas CRISPR, zinc fingers, tailings, whatever, to introduce a break in the genome, you set off a chain of interesting events. One is the generation of a spectrum of alleles through non-homologous end joining. Every break is healed up differently, predominantly through deletion, sometimes with small insertions. Now, if you're targeting, if you think that a particular motif, in this case, a GATA motif, is involved in some downstream function, in this case, the expression of fetal globin, you can simply induce a break in a population of cells at that position right on top of the motif, and that generates a spectrum of alleles. You can sort the cells by that downstream function, and then just sequence and, and look what happened. And what you can basically find is that if you look in, in this case, uh, uh, the sites that didn't out, this actually, this element here is sitting in a enhancer of a gene which is a repressor of this phenotype. So if the numbers go up here, it means you functionally perturb this. If the numbers go down, uh, it means you didn't perturb it. And if we look at the ones that are where nothing happened, there's minimal perturbation. Interestingly, these little peaks are due to the fact that there's several A's here which just recreate the site. Whereas here, one can, can look at the frequency with which deletion of individual nucleotides is connected to a downstream function. And what that allows you to do is essentially walk along and, and rank not only every, every, every motif, but every nucleotide within a motif for its functional contribution. And, uh, and effectively to come up with a functional consensus sequence, which in this case has some relation to the, to the, to the uh, canonical transcription factor recognition most, uh, consensus, but obviously contains a lot more information. So the connection problem. Who talks to whom to make the genome go? And this is a problem that we have known for a long time is complex because the genome is interleaved that you have elements in one spot that are controlling this gene over here, the next element over which is closer to that gene is actually controlling another gene, et cetera. And every one of those elements has transcription factors in there, and if we perturb them, some of this wiring can also change. So this is an incredibly important problem now in the era of interpreting genetic variation because by many analyses, if you have a genetic variant that lands in a regulatory region, a large fraction of the time, over 40 percent of the time, the predicted target gene is over a quarter megabase away. So if we don't have a map like this, we're never going to make sense of uh, the lion's share of, of genetic variation that's associated with disease. So one approach is to find things, is to go in there and delete them. And you can do this, and you can visualize those results. So if I go into well-studied loci, like the beta globin locus, it's got a bunch of regulatory elements up here, right here in red, and then if I just sample some areas along the genome to see what happened, I can delete this region. So, uh, so this is a hemizygous deletion, here's a homozygous deletion, I've completely taken it out. You can see a lot of stuff is getting shut down, not only genes in this cluster here, this is uh, uh, expression of protein, this is H3K4 trimethylation. So here we can directly connect these regulatory elements with not only these genes, but also genes downstream. And you can go to another locus, let's say the alpha globin locus, and you can do the same thing. I can remove one element and I can watch a significant dampening of transcription, et cetera. The problem is that the scale of this problem is truly enormous. And the reason is that you've got millions of elements and you also have thousands of cell states that you're trying to read out the result in. And so fundamentally, this is not an experimental problem. This is a problem that is going to need to couple predictive computational models with high-throughput experimentation as the validative arm of that, and it continuously informing those models, getting them better, and, and then moving it forward. So as a, simp as a simple example, you can look at, for example, regulatory DNA in another locus here, got a one locus, and it's got a whole bunch of elements, but if I follow those elements across all kinds of different cell types and states, what I find is that many of them are flipping on and off at the same time as the GATA promoter. I'm going to call those 
co-regulated elements. So I've got a simple model, co-regulated element, possibly controls uh, uh, the gene. I can go in there with nucleases, and I can cut out these co-regulated elements, and then I can uh, derive homozygous clones, and I can look. And in fact, in this, in this case, in this, in this locus, these elements do control the gene. I see significant drops in transcription. But I've also exposed another problem. The other problem is all of these numbers here don't add up to one. And so what I th and this is something that we've seen before a long time ago with the beta globin locus control region and many other loci is that there are cooperative effects between regulatory elements that lead to non-additive products. And therefore, this is going to be a big challenge to, to model. In the area of causation and understanding what are the core actuators of regulatory DNA, we've been thinking for a long time. We know who all the actors in the play are. But we're starting now to re-ask, how many transcription factors really are there? And in looking again at this fetal data, but now looking at it from a transcription perspective, one finds that there is fairly marked tissue selective regulation of transcription factor isoforms. These are coding isoforms. So that different isoforms can be present selectively in different tissues. So here uh, in C, it's this isoform. Uh, in B, it's this, et cetera. And if you sort of look at this more broadly, if you look at 826 transcription factor genes, well-defined, it turns out they express around 2,500 different coding isoforms just during that interval in fetal development. And those coding isoforms are not just including alternative transcription start sites. About half of the things have that. Essentially, all genes have an alternative UTR. And remarkably, 85% of them alter the, alter the coding sequence. And what I mean by that is just I'll draw your attention to the fact that in 45% of the cases, the DNA binding domain of the transcription factor has been altered. So this means that there are more elements out there that have different DNA binding domains in them than all of the DNA binding, all of the transcription factors that we know. So that is a compartment that clearly is doing something uh, and about which we have little insight. So the final big challenge, categorization. And here I think it's useful to look at a timeline again. So you know, back in the 1980s, we had these simple operational definitions, enhancer, enhances transcription, promoter, promotes, et cetera. Uh, in the 1990s, these expanded. You know, we have got locus control regions, uh, insulators. Again, by the time the human genome sequence came around, there were around 300 elements. We had these five functional categories. And here we are in 2015, 2016 now. Uh, we have millions of elements, but the problem is we still only have five functional categories. And this is why everybody walks around and calls everything an enhancer. And uh, when, when in reality, they're, they're, you know, that's like a child going through the forest and calling every animal it sees a squirrel. So it, you know, when there's a lot of other stuff, we just don't have the vocabulary to define it. And this is going to be a very big problem because it's likely that most regulatory regions and classes of these animals in the forest have very complex functions. So uh, a couple of years ago, we, we published such a class. We didn't really have a name for it, but there's a class of elements that park themselves near exons, and they loop the exons over to the promoter, and they influence the alternative splicing rate of those exons. I don't know what to call them. There's about at least 25,000 of them in the genome, and they have very consistent behavior. So wrapping up, I've defined some vignettes about what we've learned having these kind of data, key challenges facing the field. And now I want to give some forward commentary on what I think the next few years are going to look like. So what I want to do is to define a road from discovery, which is the mode that we are, have been in and will be in for a while, finding new stuff, to detection. And detection means you've found something but is it present in a particular cell, cell type or state, which could be incredibly useful depending on what it was? And then finally, to clinical translation, meaning taking all of this incredible insights that we've gained and moving it into the development and application of uh, new medicines and diagnostics. 
So if we go back to our timeline and look forward, given the technologies that are, that are in hand, uh, there, we are definitely poised to have an explosion of anatomical and condition-specific maps. Now, of course, it doesn't mean they end there. It means they continue, but, but largely getting underway in this time zone. And also, shortly thereafter, of, of the first systematically, histologically resolved maps of uh, regulatory DNA in the human genome, which is going to uh, uh, enable the joining of that information with pathology. We're also going to see the application of nucleotide level localization and assignment of function within regulatory DNA as genome engineering technologies scale up to be able to do hundreds to thousands of elements. They're not going to do millions, but they, they will do uh, uh, large numbers. And also the iterative development of hybrid computational and experimental techniques that are going to uh, allow the connection, the systematic and reliable connection between distal regulatory uh, uh, DNA and its target gene. And so we can ask, you know, if the current pace, meaning the 2016 pace of development in these areas as it is now continues, what can we expect? I think very reasonably one can expect hitting this 90 percent mark uh, by the year 2020. And there's a variety of ways uh, uh, to come to that, and in some ways even have that number higher. I think in the tame, same time frame, within the next three to four years, that uh, will be good enough to associate maybe half of the regulatory DNA with its target gene. Functional characterization, this timeline will go on for a long time, <laughs> uh, probably long after I'm doing science. Um, but nonetheless, I have no doubt there will be uh, stepwise innovation there. But also what we can't, what, what the field has benefited from and what we also should expect and not discount are the emergence of new technologies, some of them disruptive, uh, for probing the regulatory genome. And these technologies really are conditioned on the way we look at the regulatory genome and the recognition that what we are doing right now is we are taking cells out of the body, we're effectively blowing up their genomes, we're sequencing all the parts, we're basically photographing all the parts, and we're attempting to put the jigsaw puzzle back together using sequence as the joiner. But if we had a better microscope, so we're sort of using the sequencer as a kind of poor man's indirect microscope. But if we had a better microscope and we could watch these events, we wouldn't be sequencing anymore. And it is now starting to become possible to do optical detection of regulatory DNA activation in individual cells to be able to see, uh, in, not only to see individual regulatory regions, but also to watch their uh, behavior blinking on and off. And as these technologies get better and better, not only detecting individual regions and scaling up, but actually being able, ultimately, to read directly the chromatin states out of cells. And this, again, is becoming possible with super-resolution uh, microscopy and direct and generic visualization of DNA uh, in chromatin density. It's work we're doing with the collaboration with uh, Christoph Kramer's uh, group uh, and Heinrich Leonhardt. Um, and, and really able to visualize individual nucleosomes and cells. Big problem, we don't know where we are, but eventually that'll get figured out. And finally, this, these technologies are incredibly cheap to apply. The optical detection of uh, regulatory elements on a plain blood slide in a pathology laboratory can probably ultimately be conducted for, for pennies. And that will enable ultimately the incorporation think of all this information into real functional and clinical workflows. And so uh, with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, a really incredible um, uh, team that uh, many of whom have been with me for, uh, uh, for over 10 years and also include incredible uh, students and fellows, um, so many of whom have gone on to their own independent positions, uh, great collaborators in the mouse and, and other areas, and also 
uh, incredible long-term support and encouragement from uh, NHGRI, NH NIHS, and uh, the NIH Common Fund. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions, and I'll also remind you that there's a reception following this in the NIH library, so you can ask more questions then. I think there's microphones out there, so. Yes, uh, have the porcine genome been sequenced, and do you have that data available? The reason I'm asking is because of a recent interest and past interest has been organ transplantation sh shortages, and many people suggested in the past to use pig organs and humanize them to be used in uh, humans. Of course, they couldn't do it because of organ rejection. But in terms of the type of data that you're getting, you're, the implications you're making is that if you could get a large enough animal base, like pig base, in terms of their organs, you could actually build a model to figure out how to engineer, using probably CRISPR technology or something, the genome editing of pig organs so you could actually do the heart transplant in that manner. This is not an original idea. I've read that somebody was actually thinking of doing it, and I'm just wondering if you have the capability to model something like this. So I, I, I think the, the, in the broad picture, anything in which you're going to apply any kind of genome engineering technology to change the programs of cells is going to go through the regulatory genome. So it's going to require, as you suggested, to have maps from, you know, from organisms like that like the pig, and I think there actually is an effort underway um, with USDA and others, the FANG Consortium, to try to, uh, uh, to try to start developing those maps. But I think also the work with the mouse has some really important insights here. And, you know, with a pig, we just know, for example, physiologically for a variety of reasons, and then from integrating a lot of experience over the last 50, 60 years, that there are certain organ systems that actually behave uh, you know, in, the, in kind of the pig lab, they behave, you know, quite similar to, to, to human systems. But there's a lot of other physiology that's out there, and we have difficulty re reading and utilizing that as a model. And one of the interesting things that came out of the mouse analysis is that if you look at the regulatory DNA networks, the control networks for different cell and tissue types, what you find is that there are some of them that are very close, they behave very close to the way the human systems look, and there are some of them that look completely different. And I think so that it can also help kind of prioritize, you know, those efforts and gain insights into where, even in ones that look similar, where, where are the spots that one wants to intervene to kind of shift things in the, in the human direction. And the, the other comment, you showed melanoma and the intermediate state of the mutations before it starts kind of going out of orbit. There, in pathology, that's a well-known phenomenon called the dysplastic nevus, and it's been commented on because melanomas have the highest mutational rate of all tumors known, and so that's why people kind of, because you can actually kind of look at it like going out of sight, but the dysplastic nevus has been a controversial point in terms of the histopathology for as long as I can remember. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hey, John, great talk. That was very inspiring. And um, I was wondering what advice you would have for the NIH, since I oversee the hematology training program at NIDDK, what kind of advice um, would you offer to NIH in terms of training the next generation of scientists who will be using these new tools and the new strategies that you laid out over the next five or 10 years um, what kind of skills would be necessary to develop in a young investigator who wants to get into this field? It's kind of an off-the-wall question, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, but, but, but a good one. Um, I think that there, there are two things that are, the answer is really in two parts. One are actual skills, and the other ones are habits of thought. <laughs> and um, in the skill side, I think it is now clear that everybody coming through uh, has got to be able to generate and analyze their own data. And uh, as I was telling this, you know, the students at, at, at lunch, I mean, this is something that if you're on one or the other but you don't have that combination, ultimately you're going to be at the mercy of someone else, uh, and number one. And that, that, that don't, not only is that not a good situation generally, but it slows down dramatically the pace with which you can, you know, apply your intellect to science. 
So I think having that dual training is mandatory, but also it is not the kind of training that it was five years ago. Five years ago, if you had to want to do computational training and you're a molecular biologist, you had to train ground up. But now there's such an extraordinary you know, availability of libraries and other things and tools that enable individuals to do fairly high-powered analyses without a lot of programming uh, chops and, and really enough to, to, to do you know, quite sophisticated things. In terms of the habit of thought, I think here is one of the areas, I mean, I raise this because you know, from my perspective, you know, interacting with, with you know, students and fellows and going around and giving talks, I, I see that there is always a tendency, first of all, there's a lot of groupthink that goes on around certain ways of doing things and that is largely built around technologies. And so the idea that, well, you know, if I just sequence more, I'll get an answer or this and that. And it's kind of easy to buy into these, these uh, um, you know, these approaches without taking a step back. So I think that actually, in terms of habits of thought, it's like not tying things to any particular technology and approach because we're on the steep part of the curve. There are new ones that are coming. And so what that means, I think, from the NIH perspective is that now it truly has become a time that some fundamental investments have to be, and they could be adjoined to other, you know, classical type of investments have to be made in the technology itself, in improving technologies themselves. Um, because it's no longer, I think, I mean, it's only, you can only invest in a technology for a limited time and, th and then, you know, expect the next one to come along, so. Thank you very much. One last question here. So 80% of the experiments done in mouse does not work in human. So from knowing some of the sequence homology and conservation, are there some experiments that could be designed from your knowledge base that could be more useful for human studies? Could we identify some of those areas that will be predictable from mouse to human? Yeah, I, I think that the answer to that, just to elaborate on, on what I started to answer to the, to the earlier question, I think the answer to that's a resounding yes, because it is now possible with the data that are out there that have been generated with, uh, with, with mouse and code and, and other resources, it's now possible to ask, even on an individual gene level, is the behavior and the regulation of this gene, does it look, how similar is that to the behavior of its human counterpart? Or looking at an entire pathway. And so this, these are questions that can be answered in a quantitative way now that, that really could not be done uh, previously. It's not just looking at the expression. What we're talking about is looking at, because that's kind of a, a final common pathway. What you're looking, what you really want to look at is ask is the circuitry that drives that expression. How similar is that? And, and like I said, in some cases, it's strikingly similar. And in other cases, in different organ systems, which we know that there are a lot of differences between human and mouse uh, experimentally, it's quite different. And so I think actually there's a lot of information to be mined there. So when do you think we might get the circuit information? Well, I'm sorry? What? When do you think we'll have the circuit information? Well, I think, you know, I think one of the challenges, it, in some way the information is there, but it's very difficult to get out. And so this is, I just came last week from the, from the uh, ENCODE consortium meeting, and, and, you know, that consortium is, is undertaking a very big effort to try to um, mobilize these kind of data, the ENCODE and roadmap data, in, in, to put them into the hands of investigators like yourself so that you can actually explore them and answer and ask questions with that level of sophistication. And it sounds like it's far away, but it's actually not that far away in the sense that there are tools out there and it's really a matter of putting them in between the data and the investigators in a way that they're easy to use that allow you to kind of recreate the sorts of analyses that are done in, you know, in all these big papers and, and answer those exact questions. So I think that that is something that uh, uh, I think is going to be tremendously enabling coming out over the next, you know, year or so. Thank you. Good luck in better fishing. Well, thank you. And uh, I hope you'll all join me in thanking John for that great talk.